Welcome to Comics Crash Course. In the last video, we talked about superhero comics, which kickstarted the golden age of comic books. And even today, when a lot of people think about comics, they think about superheroes. But comics are so much more than that, and they always have been. Let me start with a jaw-dropping set of statistics. In his book, Comics and Consumer Culture, Ian Gordon writes that by the mid-1940s, more than 90% of children aged 6 to 11 across the country read an average of 15 comic books a month. Between 12 to 18, readership fell to 80%, and the average fell to 12 a month. To get those kinds of numbers, that means it wasn't just a stereotypical image of the nerdy white boy who was reading comic books. Kids of all races, genders, creeds, and classes were reading comics of all genres, and adults were too. That means that there was more than superhero books. Which isn't a slight on superhero books, they're awesome, but no genre gets 90% saturation. People have different tastes. So today we're going to talk about some of the other genres that were popular in the Golden Age. Adventure and action stories of many kinds, not just the superhero variety, were quite big. Before and after the war, crime and detective stories were pretty popular. In fact, Batman debuted in a comic book dedicated to detective stories, Detective Comics which is still running today, by the way. Science fiction and westerns were also pretty popular, and unsurprisingly, war stories had some cash during World War II. They lost some popularity afterwards, but experienced a small bump around the time of the Korean War. One genre that was very big then, and has largely gone the way of the dinosaur, is the jungle adventure. Stories like Tarzan, you know, a lone, pretty much always white person swinging half-naked through the jungle, Pretty popular. In fact, the first female character with her own book was a jungle adventure character, Sheena, Queen of the Jungle, and her book predated Wonder Woman's own spin-off book by a couple months. In Pep Comics number 22, published in 1941, Archie Andrews appeared for the first time, setting off a wave of contemporary teen humor books, like Buzzy, Millie the Model, Patsy Walker, and Tessie the Typist. These often weren't just funny, but featured a lot of romantic elements. In short, they were teen rom-coms. Archie has used a comfortable formula that slowly but surely updates and adjusts with culture, and so it remains one of the most widely read mainstream comics, due in part to the fact that it also remains one of the few books you'll see distributed in general audience locations like supermarkets and drugstores. The rom-com nature of teen humor books leads me to the genre I'd like to spend the most time talking about today, romance comics, perhaps the great forgotten genre of comic books. And at the height of its popularity around 1950, Romance comics took up almost 25% of comics market share. And even through the 50s, romance comics kept as high as 15% total market share. Romantic storylines had of course existed in comics before, but comics that focused on romance and for which romance was the central theme and point of the plot were created by a surprising pair. Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Yeah, that Jack Kirby. The same team who brought us Captain America brought us romance comics. In interviews, Joe Simon said the idea for romance comics came to him from an equally surprising setting, military base camp. While he was serving in the military during World War II, he said, I noticed there were so many adults, the officers and men, the people in town, reading kid comic books, and I felt sure there should be an adult comic book. He said he thought romance was about the only thing that hadn't been done yet. And you can see this adult focus on the cover of the book, Young Romance No. 1, which debuted in mid-1947. 52 pages of real-life stories, designed for more adult readers of comics. And, by the way, it's all true. On this cover, and even more in the interior, you see the tropes that will define romance comics until they pretty much disappear in the 1970s. A tendency toward anthology-style books, rather than following the same character over multiple episodes. Stories that tend to be told in a first-person confessional mode, this really happened to me. Stories that are generally contemporary, though Regency and Western settings were also popular, and drawings that emphasize characters' emotions and, of course, their fashion. Many artists who are better known for their work in other genres also worked in romance comics, and several would even say that it was one of their favorite genres to draw. Of course, Jack Kirby drew romance, being one of its creators, but so did the sci-fi great Wally Wood, talk about him more next week, Alex Toth, John Romita Sr., and even heavy metal legend Frank Frazetta. Romance comics also produced one of the most recognizable artists you don't know you know. Admittedly, Tony Abruzzo worked later than the Golden Age, in the late 50s and 60s. He worked in the fashion industry before World War II and joined DC to work for their romance titles after the war. 
We don't know much more about him. He doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> but what we do know is that Roy Lichtenstein used several of his panels as templates for his paintings. Drowning Girl hangs in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and In the Car sold at auction for $16.2 million. But Lichtenstein never acknowledged Abruzzo or other artists whose work he used this way. As such, many comic artists and enthusiasts pretty much accuse Lichtenstein of plagiarism. For Lichtenstein, though, he said the act of painting these comics is more like a remix. As he says in one interview, quote, I am nominally copying, but I am really restating the copied thing in other terms. In doing that, the original acquires a totally different texture. Regardless of where you fall on the debate, what it means is that one of the most easily recognizable images of comics in American culture, Lichtenstein's painted versions of them, they come from romance comics. But despite being hugely popular through the 50s, in the 1960s, romance comics sharply declined in popularity and almost disappeared by the 1970s. Why? Well, part of it may have been the availability of new media, like TV soap operas and teen girl magazines, though these were available in the 1950s. Part of it might have been the stringent changes in the comic code, which we'll be talking about soon, that required romantic conflicts resolve in favor of traditional family values, which makes it hard to sustain juicy drama. But romance comics didn't die out for a while after the code was adopted. Now, the late 1970s, when romance comics really died out, also corresponded with changes in the market that pushed away a more general audience. So that might be part of it. And of course, throughout the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of changing ideas about femininity and women's role in society and the family that seriously affected the main audience for romance comics and what romance even meant in the first place. So it's complicated, and the disappearance of romance comics is probably a mix of all of these factors. What has been interesting is that romance comics has been experiencing a small comeback recently in anthologies, online comics, and even occasionally in print comics like the Fresh Romance Anthology. However, the most popular Golden Age genre of all wasn't so far from the newspaper strips that inspired comic books in the first place. It was funny animals. The first comic books of the genre were adapted from Disney cartoons, and soon there were a wide array available. Funny animal comics were also one of the genres that were most successful internationally, once again, especially the Disney adaptations, which spread across the globe. The most famous of the Disney artists was Carl Barks, who left animation to make comics in 1942. And if you love DuckTales, you have Carl Barks to thank, since most of those stories are based on his Donald Duck comics. As comics became more popular, parents grew concerned about them. Whether they were too lowbrow, whether their content was too questionable, or whether they would discourage their children from reading real books. And so educational comics began to appear as a way to appease some of these fears. These included nonfiction titles like Real Heroes Comics and Real Life, as well as adaptations of classic literature like classic comics, classic illustrated, and picture stories from the Bible. Max Gaines, who was involved in inventing comic books with his work in Famous Funnies, was heavily involved in educational comics as well. And it's somewhat ironic, because when Max Gaines' son Bill took over his company, then called Educational Comics, he would make some major changes, including promoting more adult genres. No, not porn. And the parents would get really riled up. But we'll save that for next week. See you then.